So today we're going to do it a little bit different. I'm trying to follow the Holy Spirit. Um, so we'll just open in prayer. And then um, I'm going to teach a little bit. And then we're going to stop and we're just going to focus on the Holy Spirit and Jesus and allow them to bring to you whatever you receive from the teaching. And then um, we can take communion over it. But we need to be still sometimes in the presence of the Lord to receive. And then we'll worship. So Heavenly Father, we just come before you right now. And Father, we just adore you. You're just amazing and incredible and glorious in all of your ways. You are just amazing. So we just want to thank you that you are the God, the creator of everything. And yet you're a Heavenly Father, you're Abba, Daddy. You know the hair on our head, you know our comings and goings, you know everything. You love us so much that you're willing to pay the ultimate price of your own son Jesus who went to the cross for us, who was buried for us, who ascended for us. You, he, you released your son so that we might be restored back to your original intent and purpose of living with you. So, Jesus, we honour you and we declare your kingship and your lordship over us. We honour you as our saviour, our deliverer, our healer, our baptiser. You are our life, our all in all. You are everything, but we thank you that you loved us so much that you died so we could live. Yes. And Holy Spirit, you are amazing. You are so holy, and yet you've chosen to come and live amidst a lot of unholy people to bring conviction to the world, to um, make us your temple, to be our comforter and our counsellor, to be our guide and our teacher, to lead us into all truth, to show us things to come, to hear from the Father and deliver it to us. Holy Spirit, thank you. We ask you to orchestrate today. We ask you to orchestrate that we would receive revelation. We do not want one ounce of information because nothing comes from information. Yeah. What we want is revelation. We want to receive revelation. Revelation leads to manifestation. It leads to demonstration. Revelation is the key to victory. So we ask for everyone here today and for those watching on Zoom that they would receive revelation that is important for them that they might have the demonstration and the manifestation of it in their lives. And we thank you, God, that you are omnipresent, you are omniscient, you are omnipotent, you are omnipotent, you are everywhere. Every breath we take comes from you. And in this room there are angels and there is the cloud of witnesses that wants to be here. And so we welcome you right now in Jesus' name. We make space for the spirit realm to our work with us and minister to us the way the Father decrees. We thank you for angels of change that are lined up against the back wall. Yes. We thank you that you minister to the ace of salvation. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. I am receiving revelation ongoing and I want to start to share it with you because once you get a hold of this, it will change you forever. It will change your prayer life. It will change, um, it changes a lot of things. Um, but it, sometimes it's progressive. We walk into a revelation and then other times as we mature, we grow into it in other ways. So just wanting to let you know that um, you are, an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That means that every single thing that Jesus has, you have. You lack nothing, absolutely nothing. You're God's heir and you're a joint heir with Jesus Christ, which means God himself has actually willed things to you through the covenant, through the death of his son, you've become an heir. And so God has actually written out a will. And in that will, he said that my saints, my children, the ones who know me as Abba, Father, my children, they will have everything my son Jesus has because he is the first fruits of all brethren. Yes. So you are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. This is the restoration of all things. 
This changes prayer because if you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ, what is there to pray for? What do you need to ask for? It is already yours. It's already yours. So when we ask for things that has already been given to us, we come like kind of a, an orphan or a beggar, not knowing that when God gave us the keys to the kingdom, it was literally help yourself to whatever you need whenever you need it. He holds nothing back, nothing back. So it all belongs to you. The thing is, he might have given us the keys, like I might give my grandson a keys to play with, but if he's only seven, how old is he? Yes, seven. No matter how much he wants to drive my car, he is not driving the car. He can play with the keys, he can know all about that, but he is not driving the car. So sometimes the, the amount of uh, the fullness of the inheritance we walk in determines upon our spiritual maturity. The book of 1 John talks about children, young men, and fathers. So there's a, a progress. Corinthians talks about carnal Christians or mature Christians. So, you know, there's a, a difference. So it depends on where we are spiritually as to how much of the inheritance we actually get to, to use. But the inheritance still belongs to you completely. So let me just start with some scriptures. And the main thing for me, the thing that is just amazing to me is that I have received the very life of God himself. His life fills my being. I am filled, I am a present, a body that is wholly filled and flooded with God himself, Ephesians 3.19. I am filled with the life of God, filled with it. So sickness and disease has to leave. Yes. Holiness comes effortlessly, really, as I surrender to the life of God that fills and floods my being. So the, I, I just love the fact that because I'm a joint heir with Jesus, the very life of the Father just flows through me, fills me, floods me, oozes out of me, touches other people around me like it just is amazing. But this is being an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. This is who you are. Religion will tell you that, you know, it depends upon how much you pray. It depends upon how much you study the Word of God. They're important. But because you love God, not because you have to do it. You know, I pray because I love to be in his presence. I read the word because every time I open it, it's Jesus that's talking to me. He is the living word of God. Like, this is amazing. How awesome is this? And so it's, it's recognising that God has withheld nothing. You know, he says in Peter, I've given you everything for life and godliness, for life in the natural, godliness in the spiritual. I've given you everything, all things, all things. So if I have all things... What am I lacking? Nothing. But I'm, I pray as though I lack. I pray as though I lack. But in Romans 8, 2, it says that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free. It's already been done. I have been set free from the law of sin and death. I have been set free from sickness and disease. I have been set free from poverty. I have been set free from bee stings. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free free. Now the thing is, if my head has not received that, that revelation of my spirit, I am still going to live bound. I'm still going to live as though I'm not free. I'm still going to live as though things, you know, aren't what the word says because my mind has not been renewed. It comes back to, am I renewing the mind? You renew the mind by meditation. You meditate the scripture that's been on your heart. You just, it's got to become the word of God has got to become the word in my flesh, not just Jesus, you know, flesh and word, but the word's got to become the word in me. So I meditate the word. I go over it and over it. And for weeks now, it's like, oh, my gosh. And it's kind of like I'm still amazed that I am an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus, which means everything Jesus has is mine. Yeah. He shares it all with me. Like there's nothing that's withheld. And so this is like, I love this. 
I love this, but it changes the way I pray. So if, if I'm asking for wisdom, why am I doing that? Like James says, we ought to ask. But Jesus is my wisdom. Yes, that's right. Jesus is my sanctification. Jesus is my redemption. Jesus has done it. So it's 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 living out of that oneness with Jesus. And we haven't really been taught that union with him. We've been taught, you know what, you've got to pray, you've got to get into the word, you know, have you got your daily confession? Are you taking communion on a regular basis? Have you done? Have you? Are you doing? And have you done? And it takes all the emphasis away from what Jesus has done. And what he has done, I live from that. It's not, you know, it's not about what I do. Because you hear people, they come for courts of heaven or they come for prayer and they say things like, I have prayed and I've fasted and I've stood on the word and I've repented and I've done and I've, 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 and I've done, done, done. And we have to say, hey, wait a minute. It's all about Jesus. It's what he has done. And we live from his victory, his health, his life, his wisdom. It's not about me. It's about him. And so when we say you're an heir of God and a joint heir of Jesus Christ, the whole focus goes back onto Jesus, goes back onto what he did at the cross. And we live out of that union and that, that um, seamless union with him because John 15, 1 to 5 says that Jesus is the vine and we are the branch. So everything that flows through the vine flows into us as branches. All the life of the vine, the sap of the vine, everything that's life in that vine flows into the branches and then the fruit pops out on the branches because we are living seamlessly yeah. from, from that union with the, with the vine. But you are an heir of God and a joint heir with, with Jesus Christ. When you get a revelation of this, oh, I hope you do. Oh, my gosh, I hope you do. Because I understand that, you know, there's still things we need to do sometimes, generational iniquities, but there's generational blessings. You know, there's, there's, let's release some generational blessings as well. But you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And what flows through you is what flows through Jesus. And what flowed through Jesus was the life of the Father, wasn't it? Yes. Right? So if the life of the Father flows through us because we're joint heirs with Jesus, is there room for sickness and disease? No. no. Can sickness and disease stand against the life of the Father? No. So there's a whole thing. So F.F. F. Bosworth, who's heard of F.F. F. Bosworth? Yeah. Right. He wrote the book Christ the Healer, really old book. His son's rewritten it in today's language. I can't show you how old it is. But F.F. F. Bosworth, Christ the Healer. So he's written this book and his was all about, and people would get healed just reading that book. Mm. But he turned 81 and he was ready to go home to the Father. He'd had a full life, a full ministry, and it was almost like God had given him an invitation and he wanted to go home. But he couldn't die. He couldn't die. Like he'd lie down and say, yeah, I'm ready to come, I'm surrendering my spirit. But he couldn't die. So he rang up T.L. and Daisy Osborne and said, I need you to come and pray with me. It's time for me to go home but I've got too much life in me to die. So I need you to come and pray with me that some of this life will leave me so that I can go home and die and be with the Father. So they came, right, and they spent a day in prayer. And F.F. F. Bosworth says, well, it's a little bit better, but I still can't die. So they came back the next day. They prayed again, hours. And he said, almost there but I still can't leave. So they were just praying the life of God out of him, you know, like. <laughs> so the third day they went back and they prayed with him and he said, thank you, I can go home now. And he just lay back, closed his eyes and went home. But he had too much life. He had too much life. How amazing. Then Now we think that's amazing. But that should be the norm. That should be the norm. So I, I meant to bring a book today, but I forgot. St. Francis Xavier. Oh, I love that guy. He was born in the 1500s. Oh, honestly, 
I'm looking for him in the cloud of witnesses. I really want to connect with that guy. He is amazing. He used to, he spent 11 years as a missionary, went to places like China, Japan, um, Goa, um, Sri Lanka, India, places like that in the 1500s. He was, he was funded, his missionary trips was funded by the King of Portugal, which isn't bad. If you're going to be funded for missions, funded by a king is a good way to go. And it was before Luther, so the Catholic Church was really kind of the only church sending out missionaries and things. But he went and he had this heart for God. And his prayer was that he would be martyred. He just wanted to be a martyr for God. So he didn't care where he went. He didn't care how bold he was. He was just wanting to make a mark for Jesus. He just loved Jesus so much. I think in Japan there was over 10,000 people water baptised over a period of three months. Like in today, even today that would be astonishing and um, 11 years and he prayed to be this this martyr which gave him the boldness well actually he didn't die a martyr he died of a fever and where he died I can't remember where it was they um they wanted to take his bones back oh now I needed the book and I left it at home either Goa or Malacca or somewhere but they wanted to take the bones back to a certain place so he died they covered him in lime to, to hasten the destruction of the flesh so that you know, the bones would be clean when they came back in a few months and they could take him to wherever they wanted to take him. Well, they came back in a few months and they uncovered and they, they stripped all the lime away. Well, um, he was still intact and looked alive. His tongue was still moist. His eyes still looked alive. There was nothing of his skin that had deteriorated. He looked alive. And they thought, goodness, what are we going to do with this guy? Like it's a, you know, like this is freaky, freaky. So they take him in an open coffin and put him on the, on the ship, which has got to go for a few weeks travel. And the captain thought, well, if we leave the coffin open, and he's on the, on the deck of the boat, the ship or whatever, on the deck of that, and the sun gets at him, he should start to dry out, dry out and, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> really bizarre. Um, but nothing happened. So they arrived back at this place, and he is still, looks like he's asleep. They can see the bones. And the interesting thing is, they, they cut him just near the knee and he still bled. His blood was still flowing. He's dead, but the life of God in him was so strong that the blood was still flowing. How amazing is this? So anyway, a few months later, they take him to where he's going to be. I think it's Goa. And um, he's still the same. He's... Uh, investigated by medical doctors, he still looks alive. I mean, he's dead, but the blood's still flowing, the tongue's still moist, the eyes, like this is God. Like we've got to have an understanding of the power of God. If you don't understand the power of God, there is no way you can pray effectively because it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that our faith is to rest in the power of God. So it's a bit pointless knowing that I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ if I really don't know the power of God. And so this guy, and whenever they sort of poke him, blood flows. How bizarre is this? Jenny, you're a nurse. How bizarre is this? <laughs> so anyway, uh, he still looks pretty good. He's been in Newsweek in the 1970s. Um, 500 years later, close to 600 years later, he is still looking pretty good. And so every 10 years, they bring him out. They've had to put him under a glass stone because people were trying to cut a bit of skin or things off him so that they could carry it with him, you know, gross stuff. But people are a bit weird at times. So they've got him in this beautiful glass coffin and people would just be healed. Muslims and Hindus are mainly the majority of the people in the city where he is. And when they brought him back, he was healed. When he arrived in Goa in the, um, in the coffin, uh, there was a plague. They, they take the coffin off the ship, the plague leaves. Mm. 
And this is the guy like Elisha. It was Elisha, Elijah, you know, dead in the grave and they chuck another dead body in and, and he's resurrected by the power that's still in the bones of the dead bones of the prophet. But this guy really had an anointing because every 10 years they take him out and they wheel him around the church grounds even today and people are healed. Mm. Wow. Wow. And he still looks alive. 600 years later. Now, the interesting thing is that he's not the only one. There are a lot of other saints um, back from the 1200s, 1300s, that are still in pristine condition, dead, but their bodies and everything is still pristine. I'm telling you, the God who created the universe is the God that lives on the inside of you, and it is time to stop living small lives. It is time to stop, stop living as if you don't have the power to stop sinning, as if you don't have the power to change because he created the universe and he lives inside of us and we're his heir and we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So every single thing that Jesus has has been given to us. We have the same measure of the Holy Spirit and Jesus had the measure of the Spirit without measure. So we have the Holy Spirit. We've got the same anointing. We've got the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. We've got the peace of Jesus. We've got the wisdom of Christ. Every single thing that Jesus is and has and does is in you. You are not less than. You, it, the love of God has raised you up. Now, Jesus is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is our Saviour and our Deliverer, but you're a joint heir with him, which means in God's eyes when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. Yeah. He gave you the same glory that he gave Jesus. You lack nothing. You are amazing in the realm of the Spirit. It's because we don't know this, because we haven't received this, because we don't know the revelation of it, we don't walk it out. And so people are not being healed by our shadow as we walk by because we, we don't people's bones are not healed as we just lay a hand on them lay a hand on the sick and they'll recover people are not set on fire by the spirit of sanctification and holiness because we're not aware of who we are and what we have but I'm telling you right now you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ so everything every single thing Jesus has has been given to you you've got to see yourself walking as Jesus living as Jesus. Now understand that that comes communing with the Father because Jesus only did the things he saw his Father do. So it's something we grow into. But man, you are an heir of God. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And as you walk in the, in the revelation of this, as this revelation grows, things change. Yes. And this is what the creation is groaning for is the manifestation of the sons of God, the technon, not the, not the napios, the, where we get our word nappy, the babes in Christ, but it's looking for the, the mature sons. You are amazing in the spirit realm. You are amazing. So if you stop and think about it, the life of God is flowing through you. Ephesians 3.19 says you have become a body, holy, filled and flooded with God himself. That means that the life of Christ, the health of Christ, the energy of Jesus, the vitality, the everything is just flowing through you. The, the divine DNA, the blood of the lamb, everything. You are no longer a human being. You are a spiritual being who is housed in a body. But before we were born again, we were human beings. Our spirit was dead. We got born again. My spirit was resurrected. My body simply became the house. I was going to say the shack. The house, the house for the spirit. And my soul is in the process of being saved. My soul is the important thing, whether or not I renew it. And it's not being renewed to information. It's not being renewed to knowledge. It is being renewed by revelation from the spirit. So you get a revelation in the spirit. It comes up and goes, and all of a sudden the light goes on in the mind. You think, oh, man, I get that. And then our words change and our actions change. But the thing is we don't see God as powerful. We don't see the God of creation is actually the God that has chosen to come and live on the inside of us in all of his power, in all of his majesty, in all of his glory, in all of his wisdom, in all of everything that's in him. He is in you. Oh, my goodness. You are so powerful. 
so powerful. And even if you're still a babe in Christ or still a bit carnal, it doesn't matter because everything still belongs to you. It just means that as you mature, then you're able to walk it out more fully than what you can as a babe or as a carnal Christian. But this is who you are. So let's just have a look at some scriptures very quickly. I'll, and and I'm, I think I'm going to be doing a couple of weeks on this because there's just so much. But I just want to run through some scriptures. So it starts off in Deuteronomy 32, verse 9. And it just talks about how God sees people. And he says, for the Lord's portion is his people. Deuteronomy 32 verse 9, the Lord's portion is his people. You are the Lord's portion. You're his beloved. And Jacob is the place of his inheritance. Psalm 33, 12. Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his inheritance. God chose you as his inheritance. You are blessed. You are blessed. God chose you to be his inheritance. Have a look in Romans chapter 4. Lots of scripture, but go home, pray about it, sit on it, meditate on it. Let the Holy Spirit release the truth of it into your spirit. Romans chapter 4, verse 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So the seed is Jesus. That means that through Jesus we are heirs of the world. You are going to rule and reign with him. You are heirs of the, of the world through Christ, through faith. In Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. The suffering with him is basically putting down the flesh. Basically, we might have to endure persecution, um, but it's basically putting down the flesh. But he said here, you know, you're an heir of God and you're a joint heir with Christ. You are an heir of God. So everything God has, he has willed to you. He's willed it to you. He's willed the Holy Spirit to you. He's willed salvation to you. He's willed divine health to you. He's willed the wisdom of God to you. He's willed the mind of Christ to you. He's willed um, the favour of God to you. He has willed it all to you and we receive it because we've entered into the covenant through Jesus Christ. And so whatever Jesus has, um, we walk in. It's, it's just like, honestly, when we wake up to this, it changes the way you live. It changes the way you see things. Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he foreknew, God also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We are Jesus' brothers and sisters. He is the firstborn. We are the rest of the family. So we have a running joke at home, you know, like I've got five children, I've got, oh, I don't know, 12, 13 grandchildren, I've got four great-great-grandchildren. So great-grandchildren, not great-great, four great-grandchildren. I'm not ageing before my time. So, um, but my grand, one of the grandsons that lives with me, we have a joke because I said, well, I'm supposed to leave an inheritance to my children's children, which is you, and he says, I'll take your books. I'm sure I can get a stack on, on eBay for them. <laughs> so we have this running joke, you know, and he, he says, Grandma, are you buying any more books lately? Just, just remember, you know, the inheritance. But, you know, so the inheritance, that what God has for you, this has got to be the reality of your life, your inheritance from God. So listen, in Romans 8, 29, it says, in the Romans um, 32, he who did not spare his own son, 
but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? All things. All things. He freely gives us all things. He withholds nothing. Nothing. Nothing is withheld. Every good and, and beneficial and advantageous thing, whatever is in heaven, is available to us. We don't want anything from the earth. We just want what God's got for us from heaven. And so that's what he says. If he's freely given us Jesus, he's not going to withhold anything. He'll freely give us all things because he's given us Jesus. And I remember years ago there was a pastor who needed a new car and he just started said, God, I just want to thank you for my new car because um, you've given me all things with Jesus. So when I receive Jesus, I receive a new car. So I just want to thank you for that. He didn't ask for it because he knew all things had been given to him. It had been given. Like when my kids come home, it's polite to ask, but usually they just open the fridge. Or, you know, somebody takes the car. <laughs> they just help themselves. It's family. Right? It's family. God's exactly the same with us. He wants you to avail yourself freely of all that he's got. So he's freely given us all things with Jesus. Nothing is withheld. There is such, um, but if this comes, this living in this um, inheritance comes from living from that place of seamless unity with Jesus. You're one with him. You're just one with him. And that comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. Turn over to Galatians chapter 4. And this is what talks about the difference between a, uh, an immature child and a, a mature child. Galatians 4.1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he's master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. So, I, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm a baby Christian or if I'm a carnal Christian, I haven't grown very much, uh, everything still belongs to me. It just means that I can't access everything because I'm not mature enough to handle it. Like my, my seven-year-old grandson, no matter how much he wants to drive my car, because he thinks he can. He thinks he can do anything. He, he can't because he's just not able. But it doesn't mean that it's not available to him when the time is right. That's why it's so important that we grow in the things of God. Leave aside the things of the past. Leave aside the things that are old. Leave aside the things that are no good and just, oh, gosh, grow in the things of God. One thing I pray every day is, Holy Spirit, thank you that you prepare me for the future. Thank you that you grow me, you ready me, you prepare me. I thank you that you mature me in the things of God that I need to be matured in. I thank you that you motivate me and you give me the spirit of a finisher because it's easy not to finish sometimes. And sometimes it's easy to coast in the things of God. But we're supposed to grow. We're supposed to grow in the things of God, mature. I need to grow up. I need to grow from a napios, which is the, a babe in Christ, to a technon, which is a mature son of God, a 30-year-old where God puts his arm around him like he did with Jesus when he was baptised, say, this is my son. I am well pleased with him. And when he did that, he, get, he did that in front of everybody. It, it showed the Jewish community that as far as God the Father was concerned, Jesus had the full rights, the full privileges, the full amount of everything that the Father had. That's what they did back in those days. When a child grew to, a, a son grew to a certain age, around about 30, the Father would stand with him in, at the gates and would declare that this is my son and I affirm him. And they, the, the community then recognised that that son had the full rights and privileges of the father and whatever he did, he did it as the father would do it. So it would be recognised as such. So you are, you've got this. I mean, you've got this. You are an heir of God. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Everything belongs to you. Nothing is withheld from you. All things in heaven you can have. And you think about Jesus. He walked through a crowd that had pushed him up to the hill to push him off 
the hill and he just turned around and walked through them. You have the ability to turn around and walk through the enemies that are coming against you. You have the ability to do whatever Jesus did. John 14, 12 says, the things that Jesus did, I'm going to do also. And greater things than these. Jesus said, we'll do greater things. But we're not even turning water into wine. We're not even walking on the water. We're not necessarily even raising the dead. So we've got to get to that place where we realize that whatever Jesus did, we can do also because he, we've got everything he has, we have. As he is, in he as he is so are we in this world. As he is, so are we. First John chapter 4, verse 17. So in Galatians 4, 1 and 2, it talks about the fact that we might have to grow, but it doesn't mean that you have not, be, been, uh, you have not received your inheritance. Have a look in Galatians 4, 6 to 7. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba. Father, therefore you're no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You are an heir of God. God has written a will and named you that you can have everything that he's got. How awesome is this? Titus chapter 3, verse 7. I want to rock your boat. I want the boat to sink. I want to see you guys walking on the water. I want to see you living your inheritance. I want to see you um, turning your world upside down. Titus chapter 3 verse 7. That having been justified by his grace, we have become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You've been justified by the grace of God. You are now an heir according to the hope of eternal life. Last lot of scriptures, Hebrews chapter 1. I'm giving you a lot to go through because we will be going over this during the weeks to come. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, In these last days God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. So if Jesus Christ is an heir of all things, what are we? Heirs of all things. Heirs of all things. Does this change the way you might be praying? God, give me this day my daily bread. It's my inheritance. Daily bread is my inheritance. Let me live in divine health. My inheritance. The life of God flows through me. The wisdom of God is mine. The Holy Spirit everything. So we're an heir of all things because Jesus is. In John 1.14 it says that the um, ministering spirits, the angels, are sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. Are we heirs of salvation? Yes, we are. So the angels of God are sent to minister to us. Hebrews 6.17 God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise. We are the heirs of promise. The immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we have strong consol consolation who fled for refuge to lay hold of the rope hope set before us. But we have heirs, we are heirs of the promise. Hebrews 11.7 by faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. We are heirs of righteousness. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5.21 or 1 Corinthians 1.30 says that you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You are as righteous as Jesus. You are as righteous as Jesus. In God's eyes, you stand before him as if you are Christ. Now, the holiness with which we live our lives, whether or not we are a people of integrity, honesty and all, that's our choice. That's our gift back to God. But as far as he's concerned, you're as righteous as Jesus. You don't have to... 
He just loves you. He just loves you. But you're as righteous as Jesus. You know, you don't. Have, that's why you can come boldly into the throne room because you're as righteous as Jesus. You're an heir of righteousness. James 2 5. Stacks of scripture, and then we're just going to. He says, Listen, my beloved brethren, hasn't God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? You are an heir of the kingdom. Whatever is in the kingdom belongs to you. This is what creation is groaning for, for the sons and the daughters of the Most High God to recognise that everything belongs to you, that you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ and nothing has been withheld from you. The reason it might not have manifested in our lives is because we haven't got the revelation, uh, we haven't, um, our mind hasn't been renewed to it, but it all belongs to us as far as God is concerned. So I'm quite happy to agree with God on this account. And 1 Peter 3, 7. It says, Husbands, likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honour to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So we are heirs together of the grace of life. And they're just saying to husbands, to you know, really, I think that the call on husbands is huge because they are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. But wives, you know, we are to love our husbands or defer to our husbands as we would to Jesus. So there's a whole huge teaching in that that I won't go into because I'm single. <laughs> and probably need someone who's married to... <laughs> to do it but you know the thing is you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ so I want you to think about what you think you're missing in your life right now like are you missing uh, wisdom are you missing an opportunity are you missing promotion are you missing finances um, are you dealing with somebody who's sick is there sin in the in in the willful sin like what is it that you're dealing with and where have you been coming from have you been coming from a place where you have not realized that you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ that everything is yours have you been asking for something that God has already given you have you been looking at it from a place of oh well, I hope God maybe God if I pray the right way God will do it but all things belong to you in the spiritual realm, in, he in heaven. All things. That's why, you know, God could say that uh, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're called to bring heaven to earth. We can do that because we're heirs of God. All things have been given to us. So I can understand F.F. Bosworth who needed to release some life so he could actually go home to heaven. And St Francis Xavier and other saints that have been on um, their bodies have still been, I know they'll guess the word's not alive, but they're not really dead either, are they? That um, Like five, six, seven hundred years, and they are still, still there's, there is a book out on it with, with all of them. But in John chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus says, All things the Father has are mine. All things. We come back to all things. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added to you. But in John 16, 15, all things the Father has are mine. This is Jesus speaking. Therefore, if you are a joint heir with Jesus Christ, all things the Father has are yours. All things the Father has are yours. So I'm not sure if you're really excited by this or you're not sure about this. But if you are a joint heir with Jesus and you are in Christ and Christ is in you, all things are yours. Favour is yours. 
Wisdom is yours. Health is yours. Peace is yours. Righteousness is yours. Sanctification is yours. Provision is yours. Protection is yours. A relationship with the Father like Jesus had is yours. You have the power to lay hands on the sick and, and raise them up, raise the dead. It's all yours because Jesus had it. This is yours. The same life the Father has is the same life Jesus has. Therefore, the same life Jesus has is the same life we have. You have exactly the same life as Jesus. Revelation, understanding of the Word of God, understanding of the will, the plan, the purposes of God, the destiny of God. So often down here, we feel confused, we're not sure, maybe God's doing this, maybe I should do that. We feel a bit tossed and turned, we're, we're oh, I'm not quite, you know, God, if you just make it clear. But when you understand that you're a joint heir with Jesus Christ, that means you can have the same relationship with the Father that Jesus has. Remember in John 5, 19, Jesus said, I only do the things my Father tells me to do. But in John 5, 20, the Father says, oh, I love my boy so much. It's, I, I love to tell him what I want. He loves you so much he wants to tell you. But we, we're coming from, we, we actually, a lot of our prayer life and a lot of the way we live is actually from the earth up instead of from heaven down. When you pray, you should be seated with Christ in heavenly places. All things are yours. You pray from that place of ascension. You pray from there and you look down and you see his perspective and you just lean across and say, hey, hey, Daddy, can I have? You know, I just, I just want to take some of your wisdom and just drop it into that situation or I want to release your goodness over there to lead that person to repentance. And so, but it's already yours. You don't have to do anything. It's already in your possession. Everything in heaven is in your possession. Everything. God has not withhold one thing from us. Now, our biggest struggle is our mind. Our biggest struggle is the way we see things, the way we see ourselves. You know, we still hear people say, even though they might have been born again for 30 years, we still hear things like, oh, but I'm, I'm German or I'm Irish or whatever. No, 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 no. You've been a kingdom citizen since the day you got born again. That's finished. That's part of your old life. Or you hear them say things like, oh, but I'm shy. Well, no, that's who you were. But now you're in Christ and Christ is your confidence. So there's no shyness in the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, there should be no shyness in our life on earth because heaven on earth. So we, we use all these excuses. And as I, I don't know if I said it last week, I don't know where I said it, to whom I said it, but I'm repeating myself because I know Danny's heard it at least four times. But I, I'm sitting there and I'm trying to do these prayers, you know, to the businesses I do. It takes me four hours a day. I do 15 a day plus the Zooms and everything else that I do with it. And I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm thinking I've got to pray for this person. And I just, I just said to Danielle, I've got nothing left. I've got nothing left to say. I've got, I, can't, I can't think of anything to pray. I'm just empty. And I thought, I'm just going to go away and do something else and I'll come back, you know. And as I got up and left, the Holy Spirit said to me, that is a human excuse. And I went, Pardon? Like, what? That's a human excuse. You are one with Christ. You always have something. I went, oh, I was just tired. I was listening to the flesh, not to the spirit. Go back and sit down and it flows. So I'm learning that a lot of my excuses are simply because I do not have a revelation of what actually belongs to me. We've got to start thinking like a spiritual being, like Christ. So all things are yours, all things, all things. So it might look like you're missing a whole heap of stuff on earth. You might think like I'm missing wisdom. There's no peace here. There's nothing happening. There's no provision. No jobs are opening up. It <laughs> doesn't look like I have all things. But you're looking at it from a human perspective. If you take the time 
to realise that you were crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, that when he rose from the dead, you rose with him. When he ascended to that place in heaven, you ascended with him. And you are now seated with Christ in heavenly places in a position of co-executive authority. The authority that Jesus has, you have. That you can interact with the angelic, you can interact with the cloud of witnesses, you can do these things. But you are ascended with Christ. And then you look down at your situation. And then you see it from his perspective. You know exactly what to do. So one businessman that I'm aware of actually ascends. He doesn't like going into the office because he gets caught up in the everyday stuff. So what he does like doing is hanging out in heaven. And he's got a, a big enough business and enough people working for him so he doesn't have to be on site. But he found if he wasn't on site, then a lot of things weren't getting done or things were being missed and things were falling through the cracks. So he thought, how am I going to change this? So he now ascends on a daily basis and sees his business through God's eyes. And after he's seen what the Holy Spirit wants him to see and everything, and he comes back into the natural, so to speak. He picks up his phone and he rings his office and says, why hasn't Joe done that yet? Why hasn't that contract been released? Are you aware that you might have missed this or done that or good on you for doing this? But he actually, and they, they like, how does he know? Like are there cameras in the business or something? How does he know? But it's simply because he takes his place in the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. And the business runs better than if he was on site because he's hearing it and seeing it from God. All things are yours. You are truly spiritual beings. You are spiritual beings. You have a soul and the body is just an earth suit. It's just an earth suit. Although St. Francis Xavier's might have been in better condition than a lot of ours, you know, and, and F.F. Bosworth, who couldn't die until they'd prayed the life out of him. Oh, my goodness. But, it's, but when you start to look back at church history and you see that this was actually the reality and it wasn't just St. Francis, but it happened to a whole heap of others as well, going back to the year 1200, 1300, where their bodies even today are still okay. And still on view in some churches. Like, get that. How amazing. Our God is so much more than what we understand. So much bigger than what we could even think about. He's just, he's just awesome. And all things that he gave Jesus, he's given to you. And when he made the will that came into place when Jesus died on the cross, you received the lot. The Holy Spirit's kind of like the executor of the will and you receive it all. It is all yours. It's all yours. All things. God withholds nothing. And he's asking us, or I don't know, asking, whatever, but he kind of expects the body of Christ to be as Jesus to walk with the same kind of authority and power and anointing and wisdom, to be able to discern men's hearts, to be able to flow with the Holy Spirit. He's expecting and creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. For when the sons of God arise and take their rightful place, the restoration of all things, which is God's heart, comes about. God wants the restoration of all things the restoration of health, the restoration of provision, the restoration of love in relationships, the restoration of holiness, the restoration of all of these things. He's wanting this for every, he was wanting this, heaven on earth. But you've got it all. You lack nothing. Except what our mind says. Mm. So I'm just going to give you maybe five or ten minutes. Just we're going to play 
just something just very quietly, just background music, and then we'll worship later. But just have a little bit of time just to sit and, and have a chat with Jesus or the Father or the Holy Spirit, whoever you want, and just ask them to realign your life with the reality of God's word and his truth. Because you are his heir and the joint heir of Jesus Christ. And you're not meant to live the lives that most of us are living. That is not what God requires. It is not his desire at all, whatsoever. And for those of you in intercession, which is a majority of the people in this room, in intercession, when you understand that you are like Jesus, it does change the way we intercede, particularly when you come against principalities and powers. Changes it. So just very quietly, just talk to Jesus or whatever in your heart and just ask for a revelation that things in your mind would be realigned, that you can actually come into the revelation that you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. <laughs> 